I'm Eric Romoff, and you're watching the Dynasty Hot Seat. Yes, hello everybody and welcome back once again to the Dynasty Hot Seat, the only Dynasty show that is a certified inferno. And we got a return guest, a brilliant return guest, who's already fired up, let me tell you. That intro tune's got him going. We've got Eric Romoff back. You can catch him over next at Fantasy Nav. I'd love to introduce all the things you do, Eric, but you might be the busiest guy in fantasy, right? Yeah, I don't know if I'm the busiest, but I'm I'm one of the many that are afflicted with a lack of an ability to say no, right? People <laughs> people ask, I say yes, and it puts us in these precarious spots where uh, introing all the places where my work is will take up the entire show, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. It would take a while. But one of the things we know that you're one of the co-founders of is, of course, Green Screens Media. So make sure you guys are going off and checking out. You guys do a lot of basketball stuff too, right? Yeah, we do a lot of basketball stuff, right? So we are uh, we are ramping up for our one shining moment, basically from the moment the Super Bowl's over until the yeah. end of the month of March. All eyes are on the game of college basketball. So uh, we're the weirdos that have been covering it 24-7 <laughs> every single day of the year, the off season, all the way into the season. And now we're really ramping up our coverage. So dialed in on that front, getting... Uh, DFS plays out there, getting betting plays out there. If you're in a prize picks place, um, and then we're going to start breaking on uh, breaking into our uh, our college tournament coverage, right? So talk about nice. the teams heading in, who we think is going to punch their ticket, and March Madness will be here before we know it. Absolutely, but I'm out of many talents, Eric. You're here to chat some 2024 NFL rookies, and thank you so much for joining as well. And of course, if you're listening. Thanks for joining too. If you've not already, let's hit that like, hit that subscribe, head on over to Fantasy, yeah. head on over to Green Screens Media, I should say as well, and make sure you're subscribing over there too. You don't want to miss out on anything. And Eric, before we get into the overall mock draft, is there anything you've noticed about this class in general? Any kind of traits that you see, or any kind of things, any like bold predictions you have for it? What do you see with this class? Oh, I think my prediction is actually the least bold ever because. I feel like we've been talking about this class for as long as I can remember. This class yeah. is absolutely loaded, right? Like not only do you have elite talents at pretty much every position uh, up and down the board, but the depth there is insane, right? Like yeah. for the for the longest time I'm I've always been kind of cavalier in terms of, you know, moving up to a second round pick or including a third round pick in my trades this is the year where it's going to bite me in the ass, right? Because like yeah. there are legitimate difference makers that are going to be available midway through the second into the third round. So, you know, we've, we've held this draft class on a pedestal for, you know, a couple years now and it's, it's here. We are a couple months away from finding out where these guys are going to land. And then the rookie fever is going to be insane. Yeah. And it just shows a testament to how good it is because We've had a couple of guys who we thought would declare actually haven't even declared for this class, mm. and it's still holding up as a really, really strong one, especially at that wide receiver and, and quarterback positions as well. We've got a hell of a lot of good quarterbacks, hell of a lot of good wide receivers, and there isn't one, there's no Bijan Robinson, there's no Brees Hall, but there's a lot of good running backs who, my sort of prediction for this is a lot of people saying we're not going to see any running backs go in the first round, but you can't tell me if the Ravens draft Braylon Allen, Braylon Allen, he's not going in the first round. Come on, that's what's happening. So after the draft, I think we'll see these running backs eventually be pushed up into your first round year box. Do you do you agree with that? One hundred percent. Yeah. Um, you know the the earlier in the off season we do these uh, these mock drafts or these these rookie drafts, even the the less fidelity we have in our our understanding. Yeah. Right. So for me, as it will be for a lot of people. I think you're going to see a lot of this early information not really touch on very many of the running backs because more than maybe any other position, they're so dependent on landing spot to where, you know, a week, a couple of days after the draft where we know these guys are going to go, all these running backs who fell into a favorable position are going to just rocket up draft boards. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely agree. But let's see where we sit just now then, Eric, will we? As we pull up for the first time this year, hallelujah, yeah. we have yeah. the rookies on sleeper. I don't have to sit in a dark room making graphics after midnight late at night anymore. So this is this is absolutely great for my time management for sure. Eric, you have the privilege and the honor of being the first person to make a selection here on the sleeper board. You've got 101, you've got 102, you've got 103, you've got all the picks. Where are you starting with? And the absolute delight of just pretending like I have every pick in the first round is a big part <laughs> of the reason why I agreed to do this. But, yeah, um, you know, in the event where I have the 101, and I, I do in a couple of leagues, the the clear the clear decision for me is, is Caleb Williams, right? Like, yeah. there's been some kind of ancillary off the field kind of like personality nitpicking around him. But if, if you, if you actually sit down and, you know, watch this kid play, dig through the film, it, it is clear that he, he is in a, a tier all to himself in this 2024 class. Um, you know, specifically this last season being a bit of a down year for him, but mm-hmm. still statistically great on, on all the chords. And if you put in the context of the, pretty meager supporting cast that he had around him this year. The fact that he's putting up, you know, 3,600 yards, 30 TDs and five interceptions is just absolutely astonishing, right? Like plays really well out, outside of structure. The He's got an absolute hose. He can, he can throw from a variety of different arm angles, his ability to, you know, to, to read defenses and fit the ball in the tight windows. I mean, really it's everything that you're looking for in a franchise quarterback. You can, you can just about check the box with Caleb Williams. Do you think he's the first of the Mahomes clones to start appearing out of college here, right? Because we've seen that with the great quarterbacks of the past, with whenever Brady was was mm-hmm. at the front of the foremost, we've seen all these pocket passers come out. We've seen a lot of people you know, come out and try and mimic like Lamar Jackson. Is this the first of like the Patrick Mahomes like era of quarterbacks coming out and trying to be Patrick Mahomes playing in the backyard? Um, I, I think he's probably the first first to largely accomplish that mission right we'll see what what yeah. what comes for him in the nfl i'm sure there is a long list of quarterbacks that have tried to model their game after yeah. patrick mahomes they just haven't yeah. been able to be to do so successfully because uh patrick mahomes is kind of a freak in nature right um yeah. and now we have someone in caleb williams that i mean it, it looks like he's he's gotten about as close as as i can recall right like i feel i feel like it's kind of you know lazy just to say oh he's a patrick mahomes comp um, but in in reality, like you you look at the things that he does on the field, and I mean, I would be hard pressed to to find someone else that's playing in the league right now that I would be more confident in that comp than that of Patrick Mahomes. Yeah, I'm right there with you, and also like that's what I said, better college career than Patrick Mahomes ever had as well. Looks better in college than Patrick yeah. Mahomes did, like which is crazy to say, but you know it is it is true. He had, Mahomes had huge question marks coming out, and I think Gilbert's got. Got a couple less. So I think, yeah, he's a lockout 1-1. One, one. Who are you going then at 1-2? Because this is where a lot of people are like, hmm, do I go with the quarterbacks here? Do I push up Marvin Harrison Jr.? What, what are you thinking at the minute? Yeah, 102 is going to be uh, a real pain in the ass uh, to actually yeah. make the decision on. Uh, a lot yeah. of it, uh, realistically, is going to boil down to just the makeup of the individual teams that are are making the decision. I, I think there's a pretty clear two man tier that starts at 102, and it's between the the two names that you mentioned, right? Jaden McDaniels, yeah. Marvin Harrison Jr. Um, you know, in a vacuum, in a super flex, quarterbacks are the center of gravity, right? Everything rotates around your quarterbacks on your roster, yeah. and you know the positions they put you in. So for that reason, I'd go with Jaden Daniel here at at 102. I mean, it's not like he had a, uh, you know, you, you're going to have to reach to make a defendable argument for him. He's coming off the Heisman year, just absolutely exploded playing in the SEC against, you know, statistically and what, you know, NFL draft tendencies have shown us to be some of the best defensive players in all of all yeah. of college football. So, you know, you, you you get to see, you know, the the ceiling that he has out there. He had like 550 yards combined uh, passing and throwing in the game this year, like, that that upside is is unreal, right? And people are going to try to push for an Anthony Richardson comp. You know, I I think their playing style is a little bit different, but in terms of the way that we should think about him in rookie draft, 
almost spot on, right? Like someone still has a couple of questions, right? Largely to do with sample size. Like I would like to see, mm. I would like to have seen him do this over two, three, four years. But the reality is if he comes in and he looks like, you know, any degree of himself when he gets to the NFL level, he's going to be one of these huge difference makers in in terms of your your fantasy roster. So your some of the numbers that he put up, like I sort of remember watching the game that's sort of maybe three quarters of the way through the season, and I was just like screaming from the rooftops, like Gianna Daniels is the only person that can win the Heisman. It's like just yeah. watch. He he was so far. I think he was so far ahead of everybody else. And I know Panix played well, and I know Marvin Harrison Jr. played well. But this guy like, like that. towards people. <laughs> I you said five hundred and fifty. I think I think he maybe even had one game where he he got over six hundred yards until I think he threw for four hundred and rushed for over two hundred. Is a quarterback rushing for over two hundred yards in the game? It was unbelievable. But obviously there are those question marks about why didn't he do it earlier in his career? It's hard to tell, right? Will it transit to the NFL? I, I can't wait to see. I can't. In the same way with Anthony yeah. Richardson, obviously Anthony Richardson was an ab- is an absolute tank, whereas Daniels is a bit more more slight than that. Mm-hmm. But, I mean, Richardson's getting hurt anyway, has he, even if he's a tank. So you think Daniels yeah. <laughs> has a better playing side. He's maybe more risk-averse when it comes to taking hits and taking contact. So I can't wait to see where he goes. And, I mean, him at... Him at the Patriots seems to be the biggest kind of like comp we're getting right now. It seems to be there that they ever got a choice between Marvin Harrison Jr. and Daniels. So mm-hmm. that could be that could be really interesting to see that new new way of Patriots with a completely different quarterback at the helm. So I'm excited and for Daniels. It's, it's like a it's like a fun house mirror version of the Patriots, right? Like the yes. the the absolute opposite of everything that this offense has been for as long as most of us can remember would be yeah. Jaden Daniels under center and just bringing the Patriots offense into the 21st century, right? Exactly. He's he's kind of the guy to do it. It's going to be a lot of fun watching him play. I can't I can't wait to can't wait to see it. So at three then you said you had him and Marvin Harrison Jr. in the same tier. Are you going Harrison Jr. at three? I am absolutely going Marvin Harrison Jr. at, at three. And and like I said, feel perfectly fine taking him at 102 if you yeah. you know uh you you happen to have uh, stockpiles at your your quarterback position and are somehow drafting at 102 probably by way yeah. of trade but um yeah. yeah i mean these these two guys are, are really neck and neck uh marvin harrison jr would be my 101 if we were not talking about uh the super flex context and i mean look it, it's i'm almost at a loss for words in terms of positive attributes that i i can assign to this kid right like you love the size 6'4 210 211 pounds but he can separate. He can beat people off yeah. the lines. His footwork is insane, right? That's really where a lot of that separation comes from. He can, you know, he can win it at contested catches. Uh, after the catch, he's absolutely insane. I mean, like he is, he is a force to be reckoned with, right? Like it, even almost regardless of landing spot, I would say, like Doesn't matter. he's very quickly inside like the top five or six in overall dynasty rankings for for wide receivers because he's he's just going to be that like you know like i said that center of gravity that the entire offense is going to be built around him wherever he lands and it's a good quarterback for the bad quarterback that quarterback will know very clearly they are in the best position to win the more they feed the ball to marvin harrison jr yeah, he's he's going to make a bad quarterback a good quarterback by himself mm. nearly like he's i almost feel well, I don't feel sorry for him because he doesn't watch the show. Well, maybe he does. If he does, say it, Marvin. How are you doing? But like, Shut up, Marv. Show, show, shows like this, <laughs> I feel like it's going to be a little bit like what happened with B. John Robinson at the tail end of last year, where people are just going to gloss over Marvin Harrison Jr. because he's so good, and there's there's almost nothing to talk about with him. It's just like, he's a slam dunk. He is amazing. Let's move on to some of these guys who we can talk some more about. So it's almost like... What happened with Bijan? I remember doing the same show last year. It's like, who are you taking that one on one? Bijan. Okay, cool. Now let's get into the real stuff, right? Like, like let's let's chat about it. So there's no holes to poke in Marvin Harrison Jr. I don't really see, yeah, you're right. Any any scenario where we're thinking, oh, I'm a little bit worried about him. Even if he goes to the Patriots and has Mac Jones throwing him passes, I think he'll still be fine. Yeah, absolutely. And like if 
if if he's going to that version of the Patriots where they're you know they're running it back with Mac Jones or Bailey Zappi or yeah. I don't know, Kirk Cousins or whomever off the scrap heap, right? Like, yeah, the way that they've approached their draft very likely informs the fact that he will be the focal point of that offense, right? Yes. Like, there there will not be like a a one A to his one if they in fact take him at one o three. Yeah, absolutely great. So Marvin Harrison Jr. great value there at the one o three. So where are you going at one at one o four? Well, all of people may be thinking, hold on. What about what about Drake May? Is this who you're going with 104? Yeah, Drake May, the the guy that um, you know, coming into the season was, you know, kind of at least somewhat in the conversation with Caleb Williams as, you know, the potential yeah. first quarterback off the board. Um, you know, that was something I always felt was sort of misplaced. But um, you know, the the reality is like, you know, I, I think we saw more of the shades of who Drake May really is this year as opposed to you know, some of the kind of hype and and hope and intention that people had for him, you know, potentially taking a step forward in, mm. in this last year with, with the Tar Heels. Right. Um, he's, he's here at four. Like it, it sounds like I'm, you know, tearing this, this young man down. <laughs> he's still the one Oh four in my mock draft. Yeah. Right. Um, but you know, there, there is a cliff between, um, you know, uh, him and Williams in terms of being passers of the football and just the explosive upside that McDaniels can offer. The the things that are kind of concerning about May, we saw and have seen his completion percentage fall year over year, right? He finished at about 63% last year. Um, his his arm talent is insane. Like you you talk about guys who have cannons, you talk about guys that are gonna be breaking their wide receivers' fingers with how how yeah. how hard they're rocking the ball in there. Like that's absolutely Drake May. Um, you know, one of the things that quarterbacks often remark on in terms of the biggest um you know obstacle they have to overcome at the next level is just how tight those windows are he mm. has the he has the velocity to fit those balls into very small and closing windows so you know he's he's got a lot to work with overall um but he's his decision making is a little bit questionable um you know he doesn't take the best care of the ball at time but you know realistically you know these are things that I, I think he gets into a system and he gets into a a, a circumstance where someone is building around his skill set and reinforcing those good habits. And he's he's got a very high potential hit rate in in my mind. Almost exactly what everyone said about Justin Herbert when he came out. Right. Yeah. He reminds me, he reminds me a lot of Justin Herbert, including he's sneaky big, he's a sneaky good athlete, he's got an absolute cannon for an arm. One thing that I noticed as well, you mentioned his completion percentage. I asked my guy, Jess Sign from the football guys who was on, because I know he's a big stats yeah. guy. He's got all the stats. I said, what do you have like his adjusted completion percentage rate? And it was much better. So apparently he had lots yeah. of receivers dropping the ball, lots of things where it was kind of out of his control. So that kind of put me a little bit more at ease with his, mm-hmm. his completion percentage there. But I do agree with you. There are, there are scenarios where I could convince myself that I would take Marvin Harrison above Daniels and and Caleb Williams, but there aren't really any scenarios where I would take May above Harrison, if that makes any sense. Yeah, that's that, that's that's right where I am. And you, you mentioned the adjusted completion percentage. That was the story with Anthony Richardson last year. Granted, mm. you know the the raw completion percentage was much lower for Richardson than it than it is for May this year. But yeah, yeah there there are circumstances that are that are out of everyone's control, right? But you know the the reality is like. You know, you you get him with someone that can really build him up and ideally, you know, center an offense around the things that he does well. And I I, th- I think that he could he could take off very quickly in this league. Yeah, absolutely agree. And next one five, I gotta tell you, like, this is my I think this might be the best value of like the whole draft. Getting a player like this at one five when you're a mid sort of scraping into the playoffs team. You come in at one five. You're going to get a player that you're going to take here that can completely change around your team because I think he's that good. So, who are you going with one five? Yeah, M- Malik Neighbors is that that player in question. Um, you know, a uh, it's certainly a a beneficiary, if not a contributing factor to the wonderful year that Jane McDaniel's had. Yeah. Um, and you know, I mean, for my money, a guy that in a lot of recent classes. Had he had he been there, would clearly be the the top wide receiver off yeah. the board. I mean, like the 
the way that he he moves on the field, it just it it looks different, right? Like it, he's almost like one of those guys that it feels like he's running in slow motion, but he's you know he's constantly gaining ground on his opponent. Yeah, you know his his body control in terms of you know uh, going up and high pointing the ball or just putting himself in a position to win. You know, creating leverage with his body is is absolutely elite, right? Like super solid route runner. I, I mean, like you you turn on the film and you just your eye is immediately drawn to where Malik neighbors is on, on the field. Yeah. And I mean, look, I, I think, I think he's, you know, he's another guy that can step right into an NFL offense. Uh, you know, maybe, maybe we're talking about Arizona at four, right. And in immediately be, you know, the focal point of, of what they're trying to do in the passing game. Yeah. I, I just can't wait to see this guy on the field. He just looks so electrically quick. I think he's going to come in. He's going to blow the doors off the fence. He's, He's locked, absolutely locked in as, as top 10, if not higher, like you mentioned at four. He's a super, super exciting prospect. I just, I'm in my heart of hearts, I am just wanting to see him and Justin Herbert link up at the Chargers. But then as a Kansas mm. City Chiefs fan, I really don't like that because they're in our division. So I'm like, oh no, like I really wanted to go well for Neighbors in that way. But then that could come and stab me in the back a little bit later if he ends up in the Chargers. Yeah, it's it's gonna be tricky, right? Like we've got the we've got the wild card of Jim Harbaugh now yeah. now being the uh, the the head man there for for the Chargers, um, which you know not only introduces uncertainty in terms of you know how he wants to think about this this roster overall, it also creates a lot of strife for me because I will now be confusing Jim and John Harbaugh. For as yeah. long as they are both in in the NFL, because their their names are basically the same, so uh, very rude of him to come back to the NFL in terms Agreed. of my analysis. But you know, look like the the Chargers people kind of look at it as you know uh, sort of a, a project, uh, kind mm-hmm. of a, a younger team. I think a lot of that is assigned to them because they've got Justin Herbert, right? Like one of the more uh, dynamic and promising young quarterbacks in the league. But the reality is, like this roster, it's kind of old and really expensive, yeah. and it needs a lot of help, right? So I don't, I don't know if if I were in his position or in a position to make that decision for the Chargers, if I would go right to wide receiver once more, right? Like I, I think they probably add someone through the draft, but maybe not with that first pick. You know, by proxy, another kind of underscore to the fact that the depth in this class is insane, right? So like yeah. maybe they're they're looking at, you know, bolstering uh particularly their offensive line with that first pick overall. But you know, they they could trade back up. They could use one of their later picks and still get a damn fine receiver in this year's class. Yeah, that's a really good point, Earl. Like they could yeah, trade back, bolster everything up and then take a guy like a Malachi Corley or some some guy later that yeah, yeah. that does provide that upside as well and could be really nice enough. There are so many wide receivers there that that could bring that to to the Chargers. But you know, like I said, as a Chiefs fan, hopefully it's an absolute bust for them. You know, let's, let's fingers crossed. Uh, next, we're going to go to where are we at, Eric? We're going to go to one six. Who are you thinking here? At one six. Still loads of great players on the board. Yeah, I mean, like there there are tons of reasons to want to get into the first you know uh, two three picks in this draft right usually we see kind of you know a a a front loading of talent in that regard this is one of those years where you're sitting at 106 and you're feeling plenty comfortable um i i kind of feel like we're in another uh sort of mini tier there are two guys here that are completely interchangeable in my mind um but for the the sake of of argument i'll go with roma dunze here Uh, i mean like the the athletic talent of this kid just absolutely right. jumps off the page. Um, you know, you 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 love the size, you love the you know the ability to go up and win contested catches. I, I mean, to to say that he's right there with with Mike Evans in terms of a comp, like it it feels a little one dimensional just because his his frame um, is mm-hmm. is so similar. But like in in reality, like. He's one of these guys that can come into the NFL and use that frame to to body up his his opposing coverage, right? Like, yeah, there are going to be plenty of times where he's going up and you know simply reaching the ball where the the opposing cornerback cannot. There are going to be plenty of times down in the red zone where he's you know he's flashing his numbers at the quarterback and just has a 
gimme touchdown thrown right into his bread basket, right? So there's there's a lot to like with with Roma Dunze. Um, you know, if if you want to kind of walk back the the Mike Evans comp as you know, Mike Evans further solidified his Hall of Fame career this year. You know, yeah. someone someone maybe like a like a Cortland Sutton is is a name to consider, right? Like one of these guys mm-hmm. that can just absolutely throw his weight around and you know make catches work in his favor because of that frame at the NFL level. But you know, how however you want to splice it, yeah, you know, I'm I'm kind of splitting hairs on the comp, but I mean there there are a lot of different ways that Roman Dunze can contribute in the NFL level. Absolutely agree. I love the separation that he gets in the red zone in particular, like this in that end. So such a dangerous threat there. A couple of knocks I've seen in him. I'm kind of I kind of feel like they're a little bit unfair. Like the talking about the late declare, people maybe knocking him for that, but it's like he he transformed his whole physicality. He put on, I think I read it was 15 pounds of muscle or something. So he completely mm-hmm. transformed his whole body and got ready for the NFL that way. It took him a bit longer, sure, but I mean, at least he went through that process of changing his body and becoming this huge red zone target as well. The other thing people maybe knock him on is maybe want to see a bit more of a, of a root tree from him. I mean, playing at Washington with Michael Panix there, they had McMillan, they had Polk, they had him. He didn't need to run a full root tree. They were able just to throw yeah. it long to him, and he won every time, so why would they change it? So... I think it's maybe a bit unfair to judge him on that when we haven't really seen him get the opportunity to showcase it, if that makes any sense. Yeah, I mean, why why would they, right? And like the yeah. the offenses aren't aren't quite as sophisticated uh, in, in the collegiate level. They're they're catching up yeah. very quickly uh, to what they're doing mm-hmm. in the NFL. But I mean, to to the point to a lesser extent that we we're making with May, right? Like, you know, there in Washington he he was the one thing that was not like the others right like he brought a skill set that the other wide receivers in that room did not so it makes sense that they they used him in that way and to your point like you know in in terms of his ability to you know add mass and and really really changes his overall physique i i think that really speaks to a willingness to invest in the yeah. things that you know he he needs to in order to take the next step right so you know maybe he's one of these players where you know the first third first half of the the upcoming season you know there's a little bit of an on-ramp but i i do think before long we're going to be looking at a guy that's that's ready to contribute in the nfl yeah i absolutely agree and another guy like harrison like neighbors i'm not really worried where he goes actually i don't, I don't think there's too much of a concern no matter where he goes here yeah yeah i mean you know they're for me, because there are those those questions, or at least we we haven't seen a ton of versatility to his game, I, I think there's some consideration for what type of offense and what type of situation mm. he falls into. It's it's more of a ceiling consideration than it is a floor, right? Like yeah. who he is as a player, I think he has a role to play walking into the NFL tomorrow, right? But like yes. if we're talking about a guy that like can really be a foundational piece on your fantasy roster. I think his ability to hit that ceiling and how quickly he gets there is tied to the the type of system that he walks into year one. Yeah, so let's hope he finds the right landing spot. So we've gone nothing but receivers and quarterbacks all the way through six. Are you, are you changing that at seven? I am, yeah. The other player in, um, in this kind of mini <laughs> tier, the other player that if the Chargers go offense – they might be looking, taking a long, hard look at is is Brock Bowers. Yeah. Um, you know, <laughs> you and I have been having these conversations uh, on the hot seat for a couple years now, and it, it felt like there was a point where we were talking about Kyle Pitts being this, you know, once in a lifetime kind of generational prospect. And since then, almost every year, we've seen guys that are kind of of that ilk making their way into uh, into into the NFL draft this year that's that's Brock Bowers right like you know the the thing that I think is a little bit different about Bowers is honestly I, th- I think he's a bit more well-rounded heading into the NFL mm-hmm. right like Pitts Pitts came in and was very clearly like the athletic move you know offensive weapon type of tight end profile yeah and Brock Bowers can I mean he can do all of that but also like pretty solid blocker he can he can align yep. on a, in a lot of different ways in the formation right like um, you know, George Kittle is is kind of a hard comp because he's just such an elite blocker, and like his understanding of the offense is just off the charts. So, like, 
I don't want to put I don't want to put that weight on Brock Bowers right away. Yeah. But I I will say I think he's a little closer to Kittle than he is to Pitts. Yeah, I would agree. He's definitely more well-rounded like like your George Kittle can be. I think he's just someone as well, but we've sort of seen a trait recently of this whole don't draft rookie tight ends, like rookie tight ends take a while to warm up. That's going away. We've God. seen that more and more <laughs> and more. And I think I think Brock Bowers is going to be the final nail in the coffin for that argument. I think he's going to come out. I think he can produce immediately. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, with with tight ends in particular, you know, of the skill positions, I'd say uh, I was gonna say they're they're the most dependent on circumstance. It's probably tied, they're probably tied for for the for for the most with with running backs. But like yeah. you look at, you know, TJ Hawkinson in in Detroit uh for the first part of his career, like they just didn't really A know how to use him or B mm-hmm. didn't seem to have a whole lot of interest in using him by the time they were starting to figure it out he was getting closer to his second contract so they just hit the reset button sent him out and use part of the capital they got back to draft sam laporta right um so you know there are circumstances where very talented very you know high profile prospect tight ends can get drafted into a situation where they just kind of like mull along for a little bit but the hope is that you know whomever the head coach is if he's an offensive guy or the offensive coordinator takes a long hard look at the skill set of the players that they're bringing in based on Brock Bowers presumed draft capital they're probably going to want to make it a point to feature him in that offense sooner rather than later at least get him involved in a meaningful way right yeah absolutely right with you there Eric and we're moving on to 1-8 and this for me is maybe where the question marks start ramping up a little bit more. I think we have seven really, really solid prospects. As soon as we get past seven, I add some extra question marks to the players. Are you in that same sort of boat? Yeah, yeah. There's there's definitely a a bit of a cliff here, right? Yeah. Um, Which kind of goes back to our prior point. Most years, the cliff is right around like 102 or 103. So, um, (laughs) you know, the... (laughs) That, that that those first couple of tiers are are significantly higher than they they have been in in years past and in you know for me i i feel like you know these next maybe like 12 guys are all guys that in any other year we'd feel pretty happy about taking in that like 104 to 112 range right so like yes. still still hyper talented i think the the thing that you're kind of underscoring is they're just a little bit more bunched together right like you can go a million different ways uh, with with these next picks. For me, again, kind of a cop out. We're talking about superflex, so I'll start with Michael Penix because quarterbacks yeah. are immensely important in the superflex game. Um, look with with Penix, been kind of a, a roller coaster. Like you look at him in the first round of the the CFB playoff, and people were losing their minds. Right, like he was rocketing it up draft boards. People thought that he was, you know, he was going to be a surefire early first round pick and in the finals things got a little bit uh haywire for him right mm, so yeah kind of kind of cooling a bit I, I think the the reality is like the the arm talent is there to to make nfl throws people are going to make the you know the the two a comp because it's lazy and they're both left-handed i i think he's got some aspects to that in his game you know specifically with regard to his accuracy his arm is significantly better than than two was at least Tua was walking into the league, right? It looks like Tua has, to his credit, improved his, you know, his his arm talent a little bit um, in 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 his tenure as as an NFL player. But I mean, for for Penix, like I I think he's he's got the profile to you know to potentially be a a fairly early draft pick. You know, depending on where he lands, he's he's a guy that can you know be walking into week one as a starter, or he might find himself in a situation where you know, he's sitting behind the incumbent for, you know, three, four weeks out of the season. And then they turn the page and, and start the the Penix era. So, you know, if, yeah. if he if he finds his way into, uh, I mean, Washington would be way too early. Maybe they trade back, right? But if he finds, a, if he finds his way into a situation where they need a starting quarterback day one, I, I think we might see Penix get a little bit more, uh, a little bit more steam into that kind of previous tier that we were just talking about, right? Maybe maybe heat up a little bit by another couple of picks. 
Yeah, I think you're right. He's one that I, he could rise, he could fall. I'm not really, I haven't, the dust really hasn't settled with him, I don't think. I mean, you talked about the two account being being a little bit lazy, but I think you're right. There are there are some things with two of there. Did you hear who uh, Dallas Cowboys superstar Michael Irving comped him to? I did not. <laughs> he said he's like Michael Vick. <laughs> what? Yeah, it's like lazy left hand I mean, comps, right? Like that's the laziest one I've ever heard. It's like it, literally it, the only thing they have in common is they're left handed. <laughs> like, yeah. If if I go but, out there and throw a ball with my left hand, am, am I Michael Vick, Mike Irvin? Man, you, you may as well be. Like, I mean, that yeah. is just the most horrendous. He is not mobile. He's blown out both knees, right? He is not. He's not Mike Vick. I can tell you that. No. He's closer to Tua than he is Mike Vick. I think we can confidently say that, right? Yeah, by by yeah. a mile. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. But yeah, Michael Panic's in there. Just like, I'm glad he finally had a fully healthy couple of years behind him as well. Because yeah, I think yeah. when he was... I can't remember where he was uh, before he transferred to Washington, but I think he had two blown out knees. He had another year ending injury. Like every time he's, he's had some kind of roadblock in the West. So I'm glad to see him finally getting this moment to shine. So hopefully he goes, I think he's going to go first round the NFL draft. I think, I think he will, but when it's all said and done, someone will take a chance on him. Yeah. Perfect. So we've gone all the way up to eight. Next up at pick number nine, who are you going to follow up? Michael Penix Jr. So I'm going to dip back into the wide receiver market. You, you can go a number of different ways here. Um, yeah. You know, for me, I I decided to go with Troy Franklin largely because yep. I just wanted to talk about him more. Um, yeah. I mean, the, the the versatility this this kid brings on on the field is is unreal, right? Like, you can basically line up anywhere. They used him in the slot a ton, but he's one of these players that can get open deep. He can yep. he can create um, you know decent enough separation uh, around the line of scrimmage and into the intermediate part of the, the 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 field right. So that that versatility goes a long way in terms of earning playing time at the NFL level. And the sooner you get that playing time, the sooner you start to get a bit more trust, and and eventually you're getting a lot of looks going your way, right? So you know for, for me, I think his range is probably somewhere between like a Jamison Williams and a Devonta Smith. Um, yeah, you know, a lot of that, that just has to do yeah. with his with his frame. He's six two or six three. I think he weighs like 180 pounds soaking wet, right? So, um, yeah. you know, we'll 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 see if he bulks up a little bit. Um, part of what has him here, at least for me, like I, I think I think if he was a bit cleaner with regard to to drops in particular, you could probably make a defendable argument for him to creep up kind of into the middle parts of the first round. But you know, he he sort of sits as like the first player off the board in that back third of the of the first round for me. Yeah, I mean what is really unique about about this class and I mean a guy like Troy Franklin is is being pushed out. You could make an argument that your first seven picks here, Eric, that could be the first seven picks of the actual NFL draft. Ooh. So somebody like Franklin naturally is going to get pushed down because of the huge draft capital that these guys are going to get. We might not get a defensive player. I know we've got a really good, really good linebacker coming out, but I can't quite remember his name. You might know it better than me. But that we could have seven offensive players go off the board one to seven here, right? That would be wild, right? Yeah. Um, it would be it would be fun to to see that happen. Um, you know, f- for me, I kind of I kind of you know uh, gave this answer when we were talking about. Your, your chargers i i tend to think we see them you know look at at an offensive lineman maybe like a like a joe alt right um cornerbacks always get steamed up in the first part of the the the, the first round so like i mean everyone's in love with cooper De, De, cooper to um you know there, there are a few people that i think will will see kind of weave their way in but like you know we we talk about these first seven players uh in in our fantasy mock i wouldn't be surprised if every single one of them is off the board by the time we get to like pick 15 like the middle point of the first round yeah yeah which is huge like that's historically good i think right that is unbelievable so yeah i got like i got like franklin's just going to get pushed down because he's 
he's going to go back in. He's going to go to Kansas City. I hope that's that's what I'm really like. I've got my, yeah. I've got my fingers crossed for that. He was actually who I had in mind when I said that the Chargers might wait a little bit, right? Like, Ooh, I yeah. I think I think we might see him kind of creep around. You know, the end of the first, the the beginning of the second, and that might be the yeah. point where they they look to pull the trigger. Yeah, I think that's about right. But a guy just insane speed. I think he runs really mm. crisp, really really smooth routes as well out there, and. I mean, I, I I finally decided on a on a college team this year after watching it for so long. I just find myself drawn to cheering for Oregon, so yeah. I got I got to love my guy Troy Franklin out there, the greatest receiver in Oregon history. That's what people are calling him. That's 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 not that's a huge thing. achievement I've heard, but you know, I mean, that, that's <laughs> let's let's go from Troy Franklin. Where are we going next? Are you going back to the wide receiver? Well, are you going quarterback again? What are you thinking? Yeah, so um, maybe maybe I'm just kind of stuck in a box here. I was I was thinking along these lines with regard to Troy Franklin. So uh, I'll I'll pluck his quarterback off the board with with the next yeah. pick, uh, Bo Nix. I think he's a couple years away from getting his AARP card. Right, just been around forever, <laughs> yeah. been yes. in a number of different systems. Look, like some of that, and and rightfully so. It's it's reason for pause, right? Like if if he was really He's really knocking it out of the park. The, you, you're not going to see him bounce around from one place to another. But you know, it it seems like specifically with you know with his his turn here at at Oregon, he's he's really kind of you know found a rhythm and, and kind of found his his identity in in terms of you know who he is as a quarterback. Yeah, you know, super solid dual threat athlete. Like you know, not someone that I I think you're going to you know design a ton of runs for. But someone that I, I think will be able to use his legs in you know opportunistic ways. I mean, maybe maybe it's because he's he's a little bit older. You know, maybe it's because he's um, you know he's he's got a, a experience in a variety of, of yeah. different uh, you know different offenses. I, I kind of think he's like a he's like a little bit more athletic version of Brock Purdy. I know that Brock Purdy is okay. a controversial figure as he makes his way to the <laughs> NFC Championship game, but like someone that like you feel comfortable in his ability to effectively uh, execute on an offense, you know, to, to make big plays in, in those moments, you know, maybe not someone that you're going to, you know, just give him the ball and let him go win you the game right off the rip, but someone that I think has got the capability in, in the right system to be a, a competitive quarterback. I love how he's changed this game. I mean, I think, was he at Auburn? Mm-hmm. It was sort of like a, a little bit of a joke over at Auburn, but yeah, I just, Nothing. I like how much he's he's changed his game and he seems to like have really developed an understanding of things a little bit more. I mean, obviously he's a bit older, so yeah, that does help. But he's mm-hmm. turned into a much smarter quarterback, a quarterback that does take care of the ball a lot better. His pass completion was really good, I think, this year as well. So go next someone that, yeah, you can trust to come in, be a game manager, do well. And the amount of teams are just desperate for a quarterback right yeah. now. He's he's going to get a shot somewhere, definitely, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, for for me, like he's he's here in in this in this draft position because of that scarcity at the position. Like, I have to assume that he's he's going to you know get a long hard look in the first round and buy one of these teams that you know need someone to come in and contribute uh, in in the immediate term. So, you know, a, a bit speculative for me. You know, if if we find him in a position where he falls behind, you know, an, an established veteran, um, or you know, potentially has a few years to wait before yeah. he actually gets his number called. You know, a guy that can slide down a, a good number of picks, you know, potentially even a full round, right? Um, but I'm I'm under the assumption that someone in the NFL is going to look at his long career, look at the way, to your point, that he he really settled into an understanding of who he is and how he can be successful as a quarterback. And you know, look to get him in the building pretty quickly. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. The, the only, the only thing, and I've got no, I've got no evidence to back this up, Eric, at all. Oh. But I just, I can't shake it that I can just see Bo Nix as the guy that's still waiting in the green room at the end of round one. Right? I don't know why. I just see his face. <laughs> like it's just his I can face. see it. Yeah. I can see him in the suit. I can see him looking upset that no one's picked him in round one. Like. Yeah, I don't know why. I just, I, I just have a, a weird vision of that happening. So for his sake, I hope, I hope it doesn't happen to him. So in a one eleven now, Eric, are you going back to the quarterback? Well, are you going to go wide receivers, or are you going to go really rogue and go running back or tight end? 
not quite ready to go that rogue yet. Although, you know, as as we talked about at the at the top of the show, I think this is a point where you know we we find one of these these top running back prospects actually get drafted to a situation yeah. where they're going to get a lot of workload, and they're they're probably we're probably going to see their names popping up in this part of the first round more often than not. But do, uh, do up until that thought, point, I will good. I've just thought I I, I can't believe I've never put two and two together. Do you know he's going to rocket up boards? Blake Corum that? is Blake Corum's going to be a charger. Oh yeah, that's going Ooh, to happen. Okay. Right? Does it all fits in? Right, he was the main weapon over there at Michigan. They just hired Harbaugh. They need a goal line back. Blake Corum does that better than anyone else in this class. It all it all adds up, right? It it does, yeah. And I I think we'll we'll see we'll see how he he looks coming out of the pre draft process. But I think he's someone that he could that they could get on the on the relative cheap, right? Yeah, um, you know, so. we we have talked ad nauseum about how running backs have become commoditized, so. You know, if they're able to, you know, not spend crazy capital and get a guy that has that familiarity with Coach Harbaugh, um, I, yeah. I think there's there's a there's a lot to there's a lot of sense that you're making in that in that point. Yeah, because Eckler's out of town too, right? I mean, that, that, it could be Blake Corm. It could be. I don't know. Let, let's see what happens. But it's not Blake Corm today. Because who are you going with? It is not Blake Corm today. Um, I'm actually I'm going to go with with Xavier Leggett here. Um, you know. <laughs> The, this early in the offseason, there there are there are comps that just feel a little surface level. Um, you know, with with him coming out of out of South Carolina, the the thing for me is like the size speed combination that you're getting in Leggett yeah. is unmatched almost, right? Like the he he has this kind of like hulking frame, but is still yeah. able to blow right past you to outrun defenders. Or to create separation in in the short area part of the field, right? So like, super athletic. He's he's kind of got that like DK Metcalf, AJ Brown kind of frame, right? Um, you know, I I think I think he gets outshined a little bit um, because he is playing across from a generational prospect in <laughs> um, uh, you know in 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 terms of um, you know the 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 other players that he's seeing on on any given Saturday. But the the reality is like the the raw skills and and frame that he comes into the NFL with are are you know things that uh, a lot of coaches would be excited about building around you know so he's a little bit more landing spot dependent for me but i i i'm going to be super excited to watch him play at the at the next level and look you know he, he ends up in the right system and i i don't think that you know shades of of AJ Brown could be all that far off for him yeah, he's someone that has all the tools, right? He's someone you go mm-hmm. like you look at everything and you go, yep, tick, 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 tick. I just wonder what what the hell happened? Because the first half of the season he was red hot. He was leading, I think, all college football in receptions mm-hmm. and in yards, and then something happened. And I don't know if it was something to do with Spencer, Spencer Rattler. I don't know if it's something to do with him. I don't really know what went down. Do you, have you found out anything that happened with the get? Was he playing hurt? Because that that's the only thing for me. I'm going like, what happened there? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't necessarily want to speculate in that regard, right? Um, if if he was playing hurt, we will damn sure never hear about it, right? Because they, they don't yeah. want any of that uncertainty creeping into the pre-draft process. But it, it sure looks like one of those players, one of those situations where a guy is is playing through something. Um, yeah. You know, I can I can only assume that by the time we get to the the combine and the heart of the pre draft process, that he is going to be back to one hundred percent healthy. And if that's the case, he is going to explode off the page in terms of getting getting out there in his underpants and uh, and doing <laughs> some doing some drills in Indianapolis, right? Yeah, he's going to look. He's going to test so well. Actually, that's going to do wonders for his for his draft capital for sure. And Eric, we got one more pick to round out the first round. Who are you going to go with? Yeah, a, a guy that has actually been cooling a little bit, but I I think might might end up representing a a pretty solid value when it's all said and done. Uh, Keon Coleman, the the wide receiver from from FSU, another like super solid kind of size speed combo, not quite as as freakish as a Leggett, 
but someone that you know coming out there with a with a six four uh, frame who's still able to you know to to really you know, really pull away with the ball in his hands. I mean, he's he's a bit more of like the contested catch specialist. Um, yeah. You know, he's he's breaking a lot of tackles. He's he's very good after the catch. You know, the his ability to separate in the short parts of the field is probably what's dragging him down a little bit. But I mean, I I kind of see shades of like a like a Nico Collins type of profile oh, yeah. here. Mm-hmm. Um, obviously, a lot of things would need to go right for that to come to pass. But like the fact that that upside is is there and a guy that you know, up until the uh, the committee pulled the rug out from under them, was playing you know some very competitive ball and at yeah. the highest of stakes in in the college football ranks. Like, there's there's a lot to like about how he profiles for the next level. Yeah, went went undefeated and never got never got a shot. I mean, that is that is still you know we'll be talking about that for for oh, a right. while, I'm sure. But I mean, the thing I said about Keon Coleman, if you have not already, he made a catch in like week three or week four. That is one of the best catches you're literally ever ever mm-hmm. going to see just go on to youtube you're on youtube already you, you've hit subscribe already as well right and then you're going to type in key on coleman catch and it's just sensational i'm looking forward to seeing how he tests i think he he weirdly i'm not sure if he'll test that well i don't know why i, I just mm-hmm. think he is he's maybe better in on field speed than actual track speed i think he might be someone that gets burned a little bit by his 40 time but I don't know. That's more of a more of a gut feeling than than anything else, Eric. So I can't really say too much on that. And I wonder if he's going to be a guy that we see slip out of the first round more often than not when it's all said and done. But I mean, just like the get, you look at it, and you're like tick, 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 tick. There's so much there to love about about Keon Coleman for sure. And I mean, I'm just looking at the names that we still have that are second round yeah. players: Brian Thomas, JJ McCarthy, Xavier Worthy, Adonai Mitchell. I mean, this is unbelievable tez walker all of these wide receivers still there in particular that are just really solid prospects that you're going to be getting in your second round but eric before we let you go is there a player like maybe like a sleeper or a player in particular like you know what i really want to talk about him he would he was not going to fit in my first round but i want to have a little chat about him it could be more than one as well if you want oh man um it's it's hard because like in in most years when you get into the second round, you're you're starting to talk about some of these these sleepers and these dart throws, and like yeah. as you scroll down that that list, like there are some legitimate game breakers up uh-huh. and up and down there, right? Like JJ McCarthy could easily fall into the right situation and mm-hmm. you know be a be a part of this first round conversation. Xavier Worthy is a game breaker with his speed. Like he he could fall into like that Kansas city spot or maybe be yeah. the, uh, the replacement to a Gabe Davis in, in Buffalo mm-hmm. and just absolutely be on, on the radar from day one, you know, a, a little bit deeper, like, um, you know, Lad McConkey is a guy that I think yeah. is kind of interesting. He's, he's one of these like short area quickness kind of guys that, you know, can just find a way to get open in, in the NFL level. His, his frame isn't really all that close, but like the, yeah. the way that, Tank Dell creates separation in the NFL. Yeah, there's there's parts of that to McConkey's game that I I think yeah. you know someone might might key in on and and make the investment. Um, you know, if you want to speculate a little bit more in the tight end world, Jatavion Sanders. I mean, this is yeah. a guy that you know if it wasn't for Brock Bowers would be getting so much love and attention in the pre-draft yeah. process right now. Yeah. that you know I I would feel great about clicking his name, you know, midway through the second round and having someone that I can, you know, toss on my taxi squad and, you know, ride him out for a year, you know, wait for him to get his opportunity or if he falls into the right spot, he could be a guy that's going to be getting looks, you know, very, very early on. So, you know, their, their games are different, but similar to, you know, how the, the dynasty market was thinking about Sam Laporta last year. Mm -hmm. I, I think, I think we can see someone that, you know, can fall into a good situation in, in Saunders and, and really make a, a lot of ways for your your fantasy roster this year. Yeah, I think that's absolutely spot on. Those are some great names. Lab McConkey, we can see fairly down the list. And for me, I've not seen anyone in this class that runs better routes than Lab McConkey. I think he's the best. They're so clean. Like it's yeah. it's wild. You you just you you typically don't see that out of out of players of of his profile, and you typically don't see that out of players that are this far down the list, right? But like 
that that route running it's it's one of those foundational skills where like you can walk into the NFL tomorrow and if your routes are super crisp you're you're gonna earn playing time very quickly yeah absolutely agree I've got a couple as well this guy here he's far too low for me Anaya Smith out of Texas A&M nobody's talking about him at all I've been super super impressed with watching Anaya Smith so he's someone I've got an eye on hopefully I can get him in the third round even that would be absolutely sensational okay. and then I gotta mention my guy Cody Schrader no one talking about Cody Schrader he had an absolutely sensational season at Missouri last year so I, I like shutting up Cody Schrader he's probably a guy I'm gonna end up with far too much up and he's not gonna do anything but I'm going to yeah. do it on the same. I'm going to do it anyway, Eric. i got to pick my guys somehow. So I'm I'm riding with Cody Schrader this year. Love it. Eric, right. thank you once again for being back on the Dynasty Odyssey. Hopefully you've had a great time on the show. Do you just want to remind everybody, where can they catch you? What are you up to these days? Yeah, easiest way to find all of my stuff is just uh, at my at my Twitter handle, which is at FantasyNav. Uh, that's where you can find uh, the various written work and audio and video work that I'm doing out there. Um, that's where you can find me continuing to bang the drum for some college basketball, um, which is all rolling up into our YouTube page. It's green screens media. Like you play our picks and you will see some green screens on your betting and DFS app. So go check us out. We're breaking down slates four or five times a week, talking about some of the broader storylines as we get ready for March. Awesome. Absolutely love that, Eric. And thanks everybody again for joining in. If you're not already, you know, that like and subscribe button, they're there. They're free. They're great. So make sure you click them. Hey, you can even hit that bell if you want. I'm doing a series at the minute where I'm trying to rebuild like the worst dynasty team you've ever seen in your whole life. It is really, really terrible. It's got no players yeah. and some somehow no picks either. I don't really know how it's happened, but I took on this orphan. I'm trying to fix it. So if you hit that bell. You can get involved in the comments. And if you leave a comment, I'll do it. If you say you need to go out and do this, I'll go do it. So make sure you're leaving Ooh. comments in those video and check them out because it's it's going pretty well. It's pretty awesome. I'm enjoying it. So, Eric, once again, thank you so much, mate, for coming on. Thank you, everybody, for listening. And remember, for anything Dynasty, you need to know, keep it locked on the Certified Inferno. And we'll see you next time.